take a bit of a different approach than Jeffrey this morning. I think it complements itself really well, so I'm excited that it worked out that way, because I'm going to talk about that thing that you call iceberg, that culture piece. And for me, culture is not the HR department's job. Sorry. If you can see that. <laughs> uh, it's not just the HR department's job. I've been on a lot of projects where we did large-scale disruptive technologies, and there was a little side item that said, oh, change management. Right, and we'll deal with HR, can figure that one out and make some pretty things and items and you know, bring them out and create some communications and that'll be it. And of course it tanked, right? And the big project the adoption curve was horrible, etc. etc. So from all this I've been starting to figure out okay, what can we do different here around really creating an innovation culture. And as I was starting to look into it, I realized that even beyond just an organizational context it becomes important. And so I created this presentation and I sent it to Paul, and Paul was really sweet. And as soon as I sent it to him, he said, Is that a typo in your title? All right, what's an innovative? What, what do you mean by that? And I'm actually establishing here that that will be a completely different set of personality and values that we'll get to. And we want to get there, let me take one step back a little bit. The first major change in how we as humans live on this planet, outside of starting to use tools and hitting each other over the head with stones, came when we got into the age of agriculture. Right? When we started to say, hey, you know, we don't have to continue to run after these animals, we can actually stay here for a moment and drop some of our seeds and create our own little plot of land here. Right? And the major part of that was labor, we had to actually work, right? and ultimately that led us into colonization and feudal governance. Right, where it was all about as much land, as many resources as possible. Right? You see England in the 1700s. Next thing was the age of industry, because we realized in order to make agriculture more efficient, we need some machines. Right? And the mills and uh, processing plants became more and more important around it. And it shifted the focus on the machine. An interesting book that I just read the other day was talking about how in Germany, uh, Germany was in 1700, agrarian nation compared to England, which is already you know, an empire all over the world, how did they catch up? One of the reasons why they caught up was because intellectual property rights weren't enforced. So um, one of the most important machines you've ever known is the printing press. Right? So in Germany during the 1700s, 1800s, there's tons of material available. And unlike the publishers in England who had gold-plated coaches and only you know put, big, uh, put out um, books in a same word, struggling with my English, uh, put out issues of 750 or so books and just sold them to the nobility. Instead of that, the German publishers put out trade paper and paperback. And it wasn't just poetry, and it wasn't just literature, but there was a lot of scientific knowledge that suddenly was spread. And so Germany was able to catch up with England and become an industry nation as well by the end of uh, the 1800s. And then the last century has given us this wonderful age of information, right, where at the beginning of the century, uh, not just was intellectual property suddenly being enforced for patents and for things like that, but it was also the beginning of recorded music, recorded film, and ultimately software, right? That's the right idea. You, know, you only have these software tools now that we've gotten from it. We've got the internet, we've gotten all that stuff, and even information. You know, Alan earlier was mentioning the change in the agricultural, agricultural cycles. Right? It was, all of us in this room here have seen what Earth looks like in space. No, nobody's seen it before, but before the 60s, nobody had ever seen Earth as a whole. The great pirates from the 1500s, they kind of understood that if you go around, you come back on the other side, and you can trade and create all this intellectual trade between different nations. But until this last century, we didn't know that. And now we have that perspective. So the age of information has given us software, it's given us perspective, and it's given us these tools that now allow us to connect with anybody in the world. Right? And I think what that has started is that age of innovation. I'll give you a good example of that. The other day I read a beautiful article about a couple of 19-year-olds that went to a museum and they were really annoyed with this stupid headset thingy and having to dial the number for the picture. And so they went home, found whatever was available online, and created a little iPhone app for the museum. So you now can go for a museum with your iPhone and based on GPS it shows you the little pictures of what's actually in that room and you can go get audiovisual material and Wikipedia entries directly on your phone. A 19, a 20, and a 21 year old just created it because they thought, hey, we need this. We want this. Right? And so 
there's a new group of people coming up that I, you know, start to call innovators who are looking around and have the tools now. You know, if you think about another example, was this gentleman who uh, thought he would wanted to have weapons for his little Lego, Lego guys. Right? Lego doesn't make weapons; they're a very kind company, and they're sweet about it. <laughs> but he thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if my Lego guys could have weapons? Do you know how he produces these things? He uses Google Sketch. He uses Alibaba. Found himself a, a, just a, a factory in China for making it for him, and then dropping shipping it to his customers. He doesn't have inventory. He doesn't have a plan. He doesn't have any of the typical vertical integration pieces that you, we still assume is normal. Right? And the reason why we have integrated the supply chain in the past was transaction cost between the different elements. Now that transaction cost is going to us nil. And uh, one of the clients I worked with a few years ago, Fortune 500 fashion company, they were looking over at Lian Fang. They said, how does he do that? Lian Fang, I don't know if anybody's familiar with them, huge fashion company, but it's really a network. They have tons of, tons of different companies. They have agreements with these companies about minimum amounts that they take and sell. But that's it. They're not integrated. It's not one big conglomerate like the one I was working for that's trying to integrate everything. But they had all these pieces. And they were smart about how to bring them together. Uh, so they're starting to get into this new age where we have the ability to connect with one another, connect with different companies, even innovate together with our competitors, right? which is one of the things that the Fung is doing. They go and putting them against each other and playing with each other and saying, hey, let's all innovate together. Changes the game quite a bit, doesn't it? From intellectual property and keeping it up. Another thing Alan said, when can we get away from that light bulb? Right? So we're going to get away from that light bulb right now and say, okay, here's product innovation. You typically think of product innovation or something. And when contrasting it to us, this idea of bundle innovation, what is the difference? They're very different goals. The goal of product innovation is consumption. Right? I'm creating a product and I want to get it out there as much as possible, have them use it as much as possible. The goal of bio innovation is a better future. It's a different kind of life. And it's not just about a product, it can be an entertainment uh, property, it can be a social media group, it can be a lifestyle, it can be all kinds of different things. And it's really about how to be innovative in general. And those lines, those clear demarcations between these different areas are breaking down now. So now we're uh, looking at this vital innovation and see what's the difference, right? Uh, is anybody here familiar with Clay Shirky? If you look at Clay Shirky, there's a great video online. Find Google video, uh, search for it, and it's about the difference between institutionalization and collaboration. And it's talking about the Pareto curve, and it makes sense that you know, in a company, I want the 20 best people, right, who can work for me. But what about the 80% that might have an idea that helps me too? I'm losing them, right, because I wouldn't hire them for one little idea. I would only hire the people who have continuous performance, but I'm missing out on certain pieces. So there's a shift from institutionalization to networks. Just like I said with Leon Fung and some of these other companies, they're going in and just building these partnerships, and there's no institution. Some companies don't even have jobs anymore. Right? It's just a bunch of leaders working together. And there's a couple of differences. If you're know, institutional, it's hierarchical, you have your job. And one of the things that uh, research was interesting in the other day was um, if people like doing something, if you start paying them for it, they like it less. But actually, they did research where people love to do crossword puzzles. And they say, hey, I love doing crossword puzzles, right? And as soon as they start paying them for these crossword puzzles, they stop doing that. It wasn't just not that interesting anymore, right? And that's the same thing here, is if you don't have a job in an organization with a title, guess what? I'm showing up for that title. These are now my boundaries. I'm defending this job. I'm not showing up anymore and willing to throw this job away because this job is tied to my retirement, to my college fund for my kids, to my this, to my that. But it's not about this job. Instead of leaving it open and allowing people to freely collaborate with each other. So it's not hierarchical, it's not compliant. You don't have a boss to answer to it. There's no leaders and followers, but there's leaders in collaboration. But if you think about a good conversation, you have multiple leaders in a good conversation. But because somebody will speak up, the other people will listen. And then the next person speaks up, and the others will listen. Right? So you're moving the leadership around throughout this conversation. But you can do that in an organization as well, in a team. It doesn't have to be a team leader. You can all be leading this team as long as everyone takes responsibility for the outcome. 
and nobody walks away from the meeting saying, oh, I can't believe you said that. Right? But everybody takes full ownership of the outcome. The other thing is, you know, certifications and invitations. You know, today, for example, um, I forgot the exact situation, but there's a 13 year old high school boy who solved one of those global challenges around how to dissolve some of that plastic that's in a, a plastic geyser that's swimming off of Canada's coast. Uh, Alaska's coast is a gigantic amount of plastic that is about the size of Texas. There's this geyser where all this plastic trash from, that we've been thrown in the oceans has been accumulated. And this 13 year old kid came up with a solution of an enzyme that can start help breaking that down. That 13 year old doesn't have a PhD. Uh, in a country where I come from, in Germany, and to have a PhD, you better not say anything about anything. Right? <laughs> but my dad actually keeps reminding me, he's like, dude, don't say anything about big things, you know, don't say anything about anything, better, you know, unless they invite you to. Right? And that's the normal world, but we actually do get invit invitations for that. The other piece I talked about intellectual property earlier, classified information. Right? So even that being marked to the elevators here because there's all these really cool ideas going on in this building that we're not supposed to know about yet. And so I was mentioning earlier research facility and being missed armed guards, right, because it's intellectual property. That's the coin of the realm right now, right? But then you look at Creative Commons. What's that all about? There's a really great movie, if you have a chance, called RIP, Remix Manifesto. And it's about this question of Creative Commons, because all the culture that we have today was built on prior culture, right? Walt Disney is a good example. There's nobody here from Disney. Right? Uh, Walt Disney, for example, they're one of the strictest when it comes to enforcing the intellectual property right. They've sued preschools because they painted Mickey Mouse on the side of their wall. Literally. Right? Where, where did all the Disney stories come from? Grimm's fairy tales. Right? All these old fairy tales that have been orally passed on. At some point, the brothers Grimm happened to write them down. They weren't their stories either but they happen to write it down in a book. And here's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and all that good stuff that Disney put out and sues everybody about if they actually copy it, but they got it from this free culture, from the public domain. And as I said earlier, the reason why Germany could catch up with England was because of all that information that was in the public domain. So if you're going to really drive changes in lifestyle, you need freedom of that information, you need to share with each other. And Creative Commons is one of those ways to share while still having somewhat appropriate licensing use around the information you're putting out. The biggest shift here though is from mechanics to meaning. Uh, like when we talked about a couple of tools earlier today, you know, and tools like Six Sigma or Lean or even before that TQM, all this stuff is really great to make the mechanics better. But they're tools. Right? If you had a, a short conversation earlier about Six Sigma and if you adopt it as this is what it is, it's a panacea, right? It's not going to solve your problems, it's going to make it worse. You know, I worked at GE for a while in a couple of different projects, and every single project was a Six Sigma project. I was like, you guys, why don't you just ask the people in the room and you have an answer for this? You don't need to go through stats, you don't need to go through all these beautiful bell curves. You can just ask people, how about that? You know, so it's not the means all, end all to everything, it's just a tool, it's a set of tools. But what are tools without meaning? Right? And I said, over lunch, I was like, she asked me, like, what? asked me about something, I said, meaning. She said, what do you mean? Human meaning? What does it mean to be a human being? How many of us ask, how many of us actually ask ourselves that question? What does it mean to be me? What is my legacy? What am I doing here on this planet? Right, so there's a shift towards meaning that we now have the luxury to even entertain. Because in the Maslow's pyramid, you know, we get to this self-actualization part versus just having to deal with, oh my god, there's a mammoth running after me and I need to find some food today, right? We were going in these higher stages and it actually meaning comes up. So, and by the way, if I'm too fast, let me know. Paul said, speed it up. I said, okay, cool. I'll put that I had coffee this morning, so that place gets me kind of jacked a little bit. Um, <laughs> what does it mean to be an innovator? Right? Is that some weird brain function somewhere? It's like an innovative gene or something, right? No. It's actually uh, the work I've done with a few of my colleagues in a very different background, you know, from the CIO to the poet to the record producer, who was actually just completely new music. I said, what, 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 what do we have in common? Right? What, what is it that's there? And uh, I love uh, Matthew's 10 points of innovation that he's learned, and I love your five points, I have six. I have six. But these six are not points necessarily, they're more areas to be aware of. I look at them as research areas. I'm saying, in order to be really truly innovative, 
I want to continue to learn more about each of them. First one is leadership. Right? Second one is creativity. Third is holistic intelligence. And I'll get into all these in detail. Individual contributions, community wisdom, and collective progress. So let me go into those and look a little bit closer. We've all heard that be the change you want to be in the world, right? Like Gandhi said, anybody hasn't heard that before? Yeah, great man. Right? But here's Gandhi, and he lived that. There's actually an awesome story about him where uh, a mother comes to him with her child, and she mother is really upset because her child got kind of addicted to candy and sweets. And so she comes to Gandhi and says, hey Gandhi, can you help me with my child that's totally addicted to sweets? And he goes, okay, come back in two weeks. Okay. So two weeks later, she comes back and says, okay. Then Gandhi looks at the child and says, stop eating sugar. The mother says, well, great, thank you. I appreciate that you told him that, but why didn't you tell him that two weeks ago? And Gandhi said, because I was still eating sugar. <laughs> <laughs> and how many company examples have we heard where they have a, we are a people company plaque on the wall, and everybody gets traded in with the opposite. Mm -hmm. right? So if you're a leader, you have to embody that. There's a great uh, concept, if you ever, anyone of you have looked it up, called Leadership Challenge. And for the last 20 years, they've been teaching people what it's like to be a leader. And again, it's not a gene, it's not a special ability that somebody has. It's a set of values and a set of behaviors. And it's a set of, first and foremost, model the way. It's about being visible around the things that you're talking about. And there are certain behaviors, inclusiveness, right? for example, openness, vulnerability, all these things that sound really frightening and beautiful at the same time, but you have to live them. And if you don't live them, you're not going to build trust, and you're not going to have people who will work with you in the long run. They might pretend, they might do it because it's their job function, they might do it for a while, but they're going to very quickly get into the CYA behaviors around their job versus actually helping you and actually working with you and actually stepping up as leaders of their own. Because the whole goal is you want to create more leaders. Right? There's another lovely book that just came out with, uh, fairly recently called Greater Than Yourself. It's all about find something that's bigger than yourself and be about that. Right? Keep educating everybody around you. And you just have this concept of management by solution. Where I said, you know, every job I've ever had, I, my goal was to obsolete myself. And even as a consultant, you know, instead of saying, hey, how long can I hang on and get more day rates? I said, let me get out of here as quickly as possible. Because I'll come back and again and again and again because that's much more valuable to me to build a long-term trusted relationship than to get a couple of extra days in my billing cycle. Right? It's the same thing with your staff. If you train your staff to do your job, guess what? You don't have to climb up if you really They will push you. And whether they do it in the same company or whether they go transfer somewhere else, get your job and then hire you, keep trusting that it works. So be the change you want to see in the world. Really live that leadership and keep learning about leadership. And they say the leadership challenge too, it's not that you're going to be at some point, oh, I check, I do 25 minutes of behavior, now I'm a leader. It's like, no, it's an ongoing thing. And it is really be your own leader, right? First and foremost, and Gandhi didn't want to be a political leader. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to change the world by being a political leader. He was a community member. He worked around himself and said, in my community, and your community can be a family, community, your work environment, he looked around himself and said, in this community, I see a vision for a better future. I see what this could be. And because I see it, I'm going to take responsibility in making it so. And that's what makes a leader, right? just having that vision and be willing to step up and put your neck out. In most companies, that's not very encouraged. Right? But if you want to do a culture, guess what? Someone has to start it, and someone has to be that person who needs that. How many people in this room think he's a genius? Your hands? Okay. How many people in the room think they're genius? <laughs> okay, well, you can only agree on this. How many people think this person had genius? There's an interesting thing that happened with the word genius. If you look at the Latin root of it, genius, it's the same root as, or comes from the same concept as daemon, demon in Greek, right? also Atman in Hindu thought. And what is that? It's your higher self. It's sort of that thing that you know you can be. 
that, that, that higher figure keeps driving you to become someone else. And genius is not something that you are. Right? This man, he keeps talking about how, do you know how he came up with relativity theory? He imagined himself riding a sunbeam. He's like, oh, I'm in this beam of light and I'm just riding for the universe right now. <laughs> Imagination is more important than knowledge. Right? In his life, we have two different forces. We have one force inside of us that constantly wants to learn. There are new things. Right? And the other force is, I want to know. I want to feel safe. Right? I want to know what I know. So at some point, oftentimes in life, we until it'll break even point and then start, start slowing down the wanting to learn more part. You know, and sometimes if you look at old people, sometimes they're very, very biased and very opinionated because they have built themselves an identity of who they are now. And they're going to defend it to death. Literally. Right? <laughs> so staying open, staying flexible, being willing to continue to imagine things. And continue to strive for, hey, wait, just because it's like that, it doesn't have to be that way. There can be a better way. I saw an interesting movie, another good recommendation called Stupidity, the other day, and it was about the study of stupid. Because we all look into intelligence, like, what's intelligent? I mean, but we see a lot of really intelligent people doing really stupid things. You know? I'm one of them, you know, I'm a like, pretty intelligent person mentally, but like, for example, I smoke. It's a stupid behavior. Right? And I'm aware of it. And mentally, I'm totally aware of it. But there's other parts. So if you think of yourself, you can think of yourself as a you know, little bio-robot, a computer brain, right? And in that computer brain, you have different circuitry. And different circuitry, literally separated circuitry that deals with different things. When you see Michael Jordan here, tremendous physical intelligence to know where you're at and where your body is, being able to move in space, being able to balance, right? Those kind of things you see at Kung Fu Masters and Michael J. Like Jordan, incredible physical intelligence and awareness of hey, if I drink that coffee this morning and I had two cups instead of you know one, and here I am totally jacked, right? <laughs> Heart fluttering, all these things. If I eat sugar, if I eat high fructose corn syrup, guess what? Uh, it's going to go like this too, and I'm going to crave more right afterwards. And after I had that, you know, more. So, physical intelligence, right? emotional intelligence. What do I like, what do I not like? How do I become likable? How do I like people? How do I get over not liking someone? Right? And get beyond that. And I say, who, just because of a bad vibe with that guy? Trust that, first and foremost, because if your intuition is telling you something, always listen. But also be able to overcome that right? and build bridges. And Bill Gates, I put up there as an uber geek. Right? We all think of when we think of intelligence, and we think of SATs and GREs and these little tests, and, and given there's a dropout. But he's a smart man, he can program a computer. Right? That's a uh, current thing, it's like the geeks, the culture we're currently adopting everywhere, are people who are mental, mental, uh, mentally intelligent. They have pattern recognizers, they're able to program machines, do engineering, break things down. But that's again like all the intelligence. Right? Uh, Oprah up there, and uh, Oprah is a great example of relational intelligence. The reason she is who she is today is because she's able to build community a large community, and to build trust in the community. Where she again, coming back to her openness and leadership, she said, yeah, I'm a bit big right now, I'm going to try this diet, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And she shares with people who she is and where she's at. And she's continuing to build and connect different communities. Like lately she's gotten into Edgar Tolley. Right? So now all this community that was around Edgar Tolley and the power of now, and people who got that, are now suddenly in the Oprah's world, and vice versa. So it's cross fertilizing these communities and ultimately continuing to expand the idea that we can live differently on this planet. And after Picasso there, <clears throat> as an example of creative intelligence, uh, he actually is quoted to have said that everybody is born an artist, the challenge is to maintain one, to stay one. Kids actually at age five are pretty much a genius level, and then they become dumber. <laughs> Why is that? Right? Guess what? You gotta to start to be judged. You start to come back with your painting from kindergarten, and mommy says, well, that's ugly, or oh, that's stupid, or oh, it's not good, as good as somebody else's. Right? And you start to get grades. So really, all your creativity, I talked about that genius earlier, one of the biggest enemies of that genius is fear. 
I'm afraid, guess what, I'm not going to come up with very good ideas. If I'm afraid that somebody's going to say, hey, you're stupid, guess what, I'm not going to open my mouth. <laughs> right? And on that note, you know what that is? Helen Keller. Right? Mm -hmm. And Helen Keller was born, she was deaf and blind. And normally that means you get locked up in the attic if you're lucky. Right? But somebody thought, hmm, there's, there's something going on with that woman. And Alan said, so they taught her water for, for touch. And they, they, they taught her to communicate. And today, Alan Keller has influenced millions of people's lives for the work that she's done. She would have been a deaf mute in a corner somewhere back in the day had not somebody cared. Uh, well, I saw a phenomenal video the other day of this autistic woman who was standing in front of a window going, and you think, okay, good. You know, and then, Somebody decided to give her a keyboard. So she started typing. And the whole message is like, guys, just because I choose not to use your stupid backward language doesn't mean I'm not communicating. I'm talking to the wind, I'm talking to the pillow that I'm touching, I'm talking to everything. And every one of us has a piece that we can contribute. Right? How many meetings have we all sat in where there's 20 people in the room? Three of them are talking. And the rest of them just like, kind of blackberries and waiting for it to be over. Nobody asked him, what do you think? You know, I think actually Matthew said that in the opening statement, ask that voice that doesn't normally get hurt. Right? Bring those people into the game. And that's the awesome thing about these technologies that we have available to us now, because there's actually a proliferation of input from people who would normally not contribute, but because it's anonymous, because it's online, because it's in these kind of environments, they can know. And if you want to have your team work with you, there's two things you need to do. You need to constantly engage them in your vision. You constantly check with their roadmaps. Everybody in your team knows what they're doing. Right? It's a tragedy that most companies they look at. A lot of people come to work and you ask them, hey, what do you do? Right? And they tell you what they do. And you ask them, well, how does that contribute to your company's mission, vision, whatever? They have no idea. They just know their little department, their little cloud. And if there's no shared meaning, how, how can you really contribute? Right? And even coming down to simple mantras and things like that that can help you communicate. I did an example of Southwest Airlines. Right? They say, we are the low-cost airline. Anyone who works for them can understand that. Any, every single person. They don't need this long mission statement. They have a mantra. Right? And even the package guy can go, hey, wait a second, I could have a decision to make. Oh, we are the low-cost airline. Oh, cool, here's my decision process, done. Right? Because you have meaning there. In, in that meaning, you get what you're doing. And you're allowing them to contribute. Right? And continue to facilitate. I was sitting at my friend's band practice, with a lot of musician friends, and I sat there, and there's this band, they have guitar, and banjo, and mandolin, and auto harp, and there's seven, eight people playing music together. Right? And I found them, wow. Their goal right now is not to play the song. Their goal right now is to learn the song and be able to play it again and again and again. Right? So when they were together, it was not just about this one performance, it was practicing, get that project done, get it out the door, but it's the goal is to shoot past that and say, how can everybody who's involved in this walk away a better person, have learned something? If I take that as a goal, that product's going to get so much better right? because it's shared. Does anybody even know the company Zappos? <laughs> what, what do they sell? Shoes. Everything. Everything. Well, <laughs> right here. Yeah, it might seem that they sell shoes. They don't sell shoes, according to the internal culture. They sell happiness in a box. <laughs> because they want to make sure that when you get that box and you open it up, it makes a fat smile on your face. Uh, in this case, it was a Pinky boots, I think, but you have a big fat smile because you're happy, right? And it was okay, and you felt comfortable about that online buying experience. You didn't feel like someone's going to steal your credit card number, right? And they were one of the early dot coms. You have to remember that at that time people were like, oh, can I buy things online? They said, okay, right? So they made people feel comfortable, they were safe, made them happy. And they will take everything back that you order there, and it's phenomenal customer. <laughs> you shake your head, you've done that, huh? Experience done. There you go. So here's this box. Here's essentially their mission 
So not to sell shoes. But right? if you have a mission statement, mission statement is about money. Right? And if I, if I go a little further, if you have a core competency, it's about, hey, this is what we do. Right? Mm. So what, what effect do you have in the world? Right? But whatever you create, if I create Coke Zero, right, and I put aspartame in it, which is linked to all this cancer research, guess what? I'm poisoning people. This, you can create a great marketing campaign around it, make it look really cool and say, hey, zero calories. But I'm poisoning people. What's my legacy here? Right? So I can sell these other products with my pharmaceutical company afterward. Ah, come on, right? What am I doing for this world? What, am I, what is in my box? Right? What is the legacy that I'm creating for my innovation? How am I really making life better for what I'm creating? Everyone's. All the people involved in your team, your own first and foremost, right? Like in the airplane when they say, put your mask on first, because if you're not happy and you try to fumble with someone else's, and both are going to die. Right? So you say, make yourself happy. Look inside of yourself, say, who am I? Why am I here? What's the meaning of my life? And how can I create a legacy that makes me proud? And how can I get up every day and have daily meaningful activity in everything I do and believe in what I do? And this world is full of opportunities right now. A lot of, lot of problems. Right? There's a lot of opportunities to have meaningful activities. So if you go and start there and then look at who am I affecting? My team, my company, my community, my coworkers, my customers, all those people in the community. What are you creating for them? What kind of legacy are they leaving? And on that note, thank you. Uh, if you have more questions, go to my email and uh, website as well as I'm in the process of creating a company uh, of various consultants or speakers, educators, mentors, coaches who specifically deal with meaning and vitalization and look into those topics more. And if you have ideas or suggestions or experiences around it that you want to share, I'm putting together a you know, it's a book as well, so if you have ideas, and, um, let me know. Thank you.